They were doing a wonderful job. I was even listening to these guys right up here on the front. I think we need a little good trio going right there. <laughs> Sounded good. Hey, Miss uh, Beth and I were over here commenting in the aisle. Roman here, some of you find this hard to believe. Roman's driving now, okay? And Roman brought his two sisters to church tonight on a Sunday night. That is a blessing, my friend. And uh, it, I, I can't believe you're driving, but um, just let me know when you leave and I'll make sure I'm already here, okay? But uh, I'm glad you did that. Got to pick on him a little bit. Roman's a great guy. His sisters are pretty cool too most of the time, right? And then good to see Miss Evelyn tonight. And uh, it's a blessing to have her here. Uh, she said, Pastor, I, I'd come more on Sunday nights. Just I don't know who'd pick me up because the ones who pick her up normally are involved in choir. So they're here quite early. So if you want a ministry and can pick up Miss Evelyn for a Sunday night service, she'd appreciate it. And uh, she loves to come any opportunity that she can be here. And I appreciate you being faithful on a Sunday night, Miss Evelyn. And that is a blessing to all of us. I want you to get your Bibles. Go to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. By the way, I didn't mean to leave anybody out. It's good to see everybody here on a Sunday night. All right. I don't want you to say, well, pastor, it wasn't good for him to see me. No, it's good to see all of you. All y'all, like they say down south. Proverbs chapter number 20. And we have been looking at some, some nuggets of wisdom through the Proverbs here and some great things, great truths. We're going to really go through one that I, I'd say is really applicable for all of us. Although at the onset, when we read it, you're going to think, ah, this is just for those kiddos in the service tonight. But before we read the verse in Proverbs 20, how many of you know someone who by society would be classified as an adult, but they still act like a child? You know, put your hand up. I was wondering if my wife's hand would go up and she would be like, yeah, I'm married to one of them. All right. Um, how many of you think some of those people represent you in Washington, D.C.? Okay, there, oh, there you go. You know, it's interesting because we read verses like this, and yet there are some great truths that we can learn no matter where we are in life. And so tonight I want to look at Proverbs chapter number 20, and we are going to examine verse number 11. Read it there with me, follow along as I read. Here's the Bible says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. You know, it's interesting in the world that we live in today, there are a lot of things that are taking place, a lot of um, uh, decisions that are being made. And the sad thing is we are reaping a generation of young people who were not taught to do right. As a matter of fact, they were left on their own to do whatever they wanted to do because many parents didn't want to ruffle any feathers. Many teachers didn't want the problems. And so now we come to a verse like that and we say, yeah, there's some people that are known by their doings, all right. And as a matter of fact, they're making some very, very um, poor decisions. Uh, for some, maybe that were even raised in church, they have maybe backslid away from that. They've gone wayward. And what I'm going to share tonight is this. We are all given personal responsibility. We all make choices. And so if a child chooses to do that, they make that choice. But there is some weight that falls back on mom and dad's shoulders as well. There's some training that God wants us to do with our children, with those that God brings in. And by the way, you may not have children. You may have gone through those child year, uh, uh, training years but do you know as a church family, as a body, guess what? We're all given that responsibility. Maybe as a Sunday school teacher, maybe as someone that comes alongside and is encouraging that next generation. Maybe a family that lives next to you. Maybe someone that you work with that's really struggling. And the truths from God's word, these practical principles of wisdom can be used to really guide and direct. So I'm going to challenge you, whether you're a young person, whether you are an adult that is raising young people, maybe you have gone through that stage, but I want us to look, even in the society that we live in, how many of these principles that God said were not followed, and now we're seeing the consequences of them. Back on April 20th of 1999, in the small town of Littleton, Colorado, two high school students, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold enacted an all-out assault at Columbine High School. Many of you may remember the news from that. The boys' plan was to kill hundreds of their classmates, peers, 
using guns, knives, homemade explosives. So they walked into the halls, into the classrooms of that high school that day, and they sought to do as much damage as possible. They were killing people at will. I can still remember the pictures, the news pictures of, of uh, agents running around the building looking for ways in. How are we going to manage this situation, not knowing what they were going into? When the day was done, 12 students, one teacher, and both Eric and Dylan were dead. In a, in a report that was written by, um, uh, by uh, it was actually in the Wichita Eagle, I believe, two days after this event, this quote. Klebold was a follower, not a leader, who went astray after he met Harris, friends say. In Cub Scouts, he was a bright, dedicated boy who worked hard for his badges. He also got along well with his older brother. But four years ago, he met Harris. Dylan was real quiet, real smart, said Bumgart, who knew Klebold from grade school. When Eric and Dylan got together, Eric changed Dylan's demeanor. The two got their own home computers they linked them with modems. They had death matches and violent video games. Matching computer to computer, Bumgarter said. They'd play these games for hours and hours. And um, since that time, who can count how many things like that have taken place? On college campuses, in, uh, in subways in New York City, all over our country and really around the world, it seems as if there are not only children, but now children who have become adults that really are going out and doing the things that they want to do. So if you notice the verse, the, the, the proverb here says, even a child is known by his doings, his, his actions, whether his work be pure. And praise God for those who are known for their works that are done, that are right and good and pleasing to the Lord. But Notice he also says there, whether it be right. You know, I believe God's desire is that as parents, we train our children. We train this next generation to be known, not for the, the, uh, all the uh, evil things that children do, but for the good. For things that are right and pure. I, I'm thinking, you know, when, when the Bible through the Apostle Paul is encouraging Timothy. He's encouraging me as a young man. And he says, Timothy, I, I want you to be an example of the believer. But he says in those verses, a, as you read that verse, he's reminding him, you know what? Oftentimes children are looked down upon for this reason. Just because they're children. He says, let no man despise thy youth. The word despise can mean, it can mean hatred towards, it can mean with a, a, a disdain or looking down upon. He says, there are oftentimes parents, adults, who look down upon children just because they're children. Maybe you have said, that. oh, you know, they're just kids. I mean, all those kids are just always getting in trouble. I mean, they're always doing those things. Those ornery, pesky teenagers. And, you know, oftentimes as young people, they're looked down upon because of things that they do that are wrong. And Paul says to Timothy in that verse, he says, I want you to be an example of the believer. And then he goes through a list of things in word, conversation, in charity, in faith, in spirit, in purity. And he gives him a list of good things. Hey, hey, Timothy, be known for this. Don't let people look down upon you just because you're a young person. And you know, when we mention names like Eric Harris or Dylan Klebold or others that have been involved in those things, a picture of those individuals come to our mind and what's known about them is not good. As a matter of fact, there are young people that I was in, in uh, high school with. There are young, young people that I went to college with that now, when their name comes to my mind, what comes up is someone who is not doing right. They're known by things that they've done. Maybe they have, they have left their families. Maybe they have, they have denounced the things of God. And because of that, I get this picture in my mind of that person. And that's what they're known for. And as a church and as parents, we have a great responsibility to our young people. We have a responsibility to teach them what is right and to train them. In Proverbs 22, verse number 6, train up a child in the way he is old. Uh, and train the child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. One thing we know this, if a child goes away and is wayward, if that truth has been instilled in him, guess what? That truth is going with him all the time. 
that truth. He knows what's right. He knows. She knows what's right. Mom and dad taught me that or, or that's not right. I know God said that wasn't right. And although they may try to get away from that, that truth will continue to follow them. So as a church and as a people, as parents, we have a great responsibility this generation. As I said this morning, if we don't train young people to do right and to please God, who's going to do it? Public school system isn't going to do it. Secular universities aren't going to do it. They're not going to get that out in the workplace for the most part. It's going to have to happen right here. And so if we don't take this responsibility as a church and as parents, by the way, um, you know, obviously that responsibility ultimately lies on the parents. A lot of them like to say, well, it's the church's fault. But you know what? Hand in hand, you know what can be accomplished? Parents teaching and training their children to do right and godly examples coming alongside and encouraging them along the way. I think of the story in the, uh, in the Old Testament, it was Elijah and he comes and there's a mom and her son is sick and dead and Elijah comes along, kind of that picture of someone who comes along and says, here, you know what? I've got some help. I've got some hope that I can offer to you. And so ultimately, as, as parents, as grandparents, it's a great responsibility, and as a whole, as a church. And so there's several things I want us to look at tonight. First of all, in the negative aspect, why is it that some young people, why is it some adults that have been taught truth, that have, um, have been given what is right to do, why is it that some of them go wayward? We looked at backsliding in Sunday school this morning. Can a, can a Christian believer backslide? Of course they can. It's not what God desires. It's not the plan and the purpose that God has. But I want you to see some, some reasons. There's several things that can contribute to that. It's not an exhaustive list. But uh, just some things that I believe we can see in Scripture. But also, and you may say, oh yeah, I know somebody that because of that and some decisions that they made. So let's look at a few of these. I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number one. And we will let our fingers do the walking through God's word tonight. Number one, and this is a key one. I found this true in my own life. I have found this true in the lives of uh, some that were very close to me. Some things that contribute to someone moving away from things that they've been taught. The things of the Lord, the, the doings, the, the good things. Number one, and I think it is a key one, is this. Acquaintances. Friends. Some people have said this, your friends can make you or break you. And oh, how often I, I have seen this. I, I've said this before, that when I went to Bible college, there were people who I went with that had the same training and the same background that I had come up in, and they didn't make it at Bible college, some of them, for one whole semester. And one thing was the key contributing factor. It was, they got in them with the wrong crowd. Because no matter where you go, there's always going to be that opportunity. It's amazing how those people find each other. And so friends, I want you to notice Proverbs chapter number one. Friends often have a very influential part in the life of a young person. Really, friends have a, an influential life in, in, in all of our lives. But look at Proverbs chapter one. So you may ask the question, how do I know if I have the right kind of friend? What kind of warning signs? Well, I'm glad you asked because the Bible tells us in Proverbs 1.10, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain. Which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. You know, there's a lot there, but uh, suffice to say, he's describing someone who has a bad influence. Someone you don't want to be around. As a young person, someone you don't want to be around as an adult. And I will say this, I've known many adults that have been drawn away from doing right by influences of acquaintances and friends in their life. They've made some wrong choices. They've gone to some wrong places. They've done some things that are not pleasing to God. So how do I know? Well, here's the question. Where are they trying to lead you? 
This friend, so-called friend, is trying to lead to the path of destruction. He, he, he may not come out and say that, but that's the direction that he's head, headed. And even a good Christian can be led astray because of the wrong friends, because of the wrong acquaintances. You know, I would challenge every person here, from youngest to oldest, your closest friends ought to be godly people. As a man, your closest friends ought to be other godly men. As a lady, other godly ladies, children, teenagers, as other godly young people. Why? Because you want to be encouraged to do right. There is enough pull from the society that we live in. There is a, a, a devil who is real, who's going to try to get you to do wrong. The thing you're going to need is as much encouragement as possible. So what does Satan do? Satan likes to bring in friends. Satan likes to drive a wedge between children and their parents so that, uh, you know what, they don't want to hear what mom and dad have to say, but they'll listen to what a friend says. And Proverbs remind us that friend's leading you to destruction. How many have lost lives? And I, I think of this story of, of Dylan and Eric. And, and you know what? You know what I, it boils down to? Getting involved with the wrong crowd. And it played a big influence. And so acquaintance, our acquaintances are very important. Here's some verses you can mark down. Proverbs chapter 12 in verse number 26. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduces them. Proverbs 22 verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man thou shalt not go. I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15 33 in the message this morning. Be not deceived, evil communication corrupteth good manners. There are often times people say, well, I, I want to get close to them and I want to be a friend to them because I want to help encourage them to do right. You know what you'll find more often happens? They encourage you to do wrong. Before you bring them up, they draw you down. And so it's not saying that you can't have a friend that is an unsaved person or you can't have a friend or try to reach into the life of someone. But all I'm saying is your closest acquaintances and friends ought to be people who have the desire to love God with all their heart, their soul, their mind and their strength. That's why I think the church is important. Not perfect people, but like-minded, encouraging one another. You see someone going in the wrong direction, you can go and you can encourage them. That's not a path that you want to take. And so I think as you look at, at illustrations, and I would suffice to say that if you and I examine the lives of those that have been involved in Columbine and things at Virginia Tech and other places in our country, you would find a few things to be true. Number one, they probably had wrong friends. Many times there wasn't parental influence in their life, especially not fathers. And over and over again, the pattern just repeats itself. And so guess what? It places great responsibility on us, not only to teach this, but to exemplify this. Acquaintance, friends. But I want you to see a second thing. Proverbs has a lot to say about this as well, but we could, we could alliterate it like this. Articulation or words that we say, our language. Because words that are spoken oftentimes either are going to encourage us towards godliness or they're going to encourage us towards worldliness. Here's some verses. Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 8. All the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There is nothing froward or perverse in them. I love Psalm 19, 14. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. You know what oftentimes will draw people away is words. And we may hear, well, I like to hear that. Sometimes we'll go to a person who we would call a friend because we want them to tell us what we want to hear. That's how we're going to get our affirmation. Well, I want them to agree with the way that I'm living. And so maybe we're involved in wrong and we know it. And so we're going to go to that person. Hey, I need some advice on this area, knowing that they are going to say something that could agree with us. I'll give you an example. My sister, um, she's, she's in heaven now, so I feel like I can share this. But my sister was involved in some situations and her friends were telling her to follow her heart. And so she loved going to those people because they'd say, oh, Sonia, just follow your heart. She didn't want to come and talk to me because she knew what kind of answer she was going to get. But she did. She called me. I remember I was a youth pastor up in Pennsylvania and she called me one day. I still remember where I was sitting. We were in a little house, a little mission house right off the church there. We hadn't gotten a house of our own. And she calls me. I remember she was in tears and she said, Michael, she says, um, all my friends in this situation are telling me to follow my heart. What should I do? And I said, that is the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. 
And she kind of got real quiet. I said, son, your heart is deceitful. It's wicked. Don't follow your heart. Follow what you know is truth. And you know this is wrong. And she said, I know, but it's not what I want to do. I said, well, you called the wrong person because I'm not going to encourage you to do it if you know it's not what you should do. But isn't it interesting how we go to people because we know what they might say. Your children know that, by the way. They know who to go to. I've told you, if they want compassion in my house, they ain't coming to me. They're going to their mother. Because I ain't giving it to them, unless it's deserved. I mean, if, if blood is gushing out and bones are sticking out, they might get some compassion. Otherwise, suck it up, buttercup. You know, come on now. We, let's, let's go. We got to keep moving on. We got things to do. But if they want, you know, some adventure, you know what? They may come and see me. Hey, Dad, can we go? Oh, no, that sounds like fun. You know, let's try that. Mom may be a little more cautious. Oh, honey, I don't know, you know. They're just still kind of, no, no, let's go do this. Let's go try this. We knew that with my parents. If we want to do something fun and exciting, we went to my dad. Because my dad was like, sure, go ahead. You know, don't kill yourself, but, you know, go ahead. Uh, mom, always fearful. Like, I don't know about that. I don't know if you should do that. That's kind of dangerous. Yeah, mom, that's why we want to do it, you know. But they know that. So they go to that person. But think of how important words are. Words that we say. You know, oftentimes, one thing that causes children to go astray is they hear one thing in the home and they hear something totally different at church. We darken the doors or we come in the doors of, that church, of the church building and we know the Christian lingo, we know the words to say, we know what not to say, and then we get home and it's not that way. Did you, did you pick up on that verse, make no friendship with an angry man? Homes that are filled with anger. Homes that are filled with words that aren't pleasing to the Lord. And we wouldn't say them maybe amongst our Christian friends, but boy, we know the world would accept that. And so we don't mind saying it at the workplace. Can I challenge you and I as parents in raising this next generation to be very careful with the words that we say? Not only that, but the words that we allow. Off color. The world is full of off color gestures and comments and crude com and that's why I think Paul in Ephesians he said that hey don't let that be once named among you as become as saints it's important words are very important and we should pay close attention listen to what your kids are talking about things that they're saying um, anytime uh, this has happened there were times we traveled and we were in churches and our parents or our kids would come home and would say a word and we'd stop and say whoa whoa we don't say that word now, where'd you hear that from? Oh, they may have heard that in Sunday school, or they may have heard that with some other friends that they were playing with. Well, they may say that, but we ain't saying that in this house. We're not talking like that. And we need to teach them and instruct them because they're going to face those. They're going to face that. They're going to hear those things. Thirdly, not only do we see here our, our uh, acquaintances, our friends, but also we see articulation, our words, our language. But thirdly, I want you to notice, notice this, our appetites, our desires. Desire is the internal act which, by influencing the will, makes us proceed to action. And so we desire something. That's why it was specifically stated in God's Word. 1 John chapter number 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world. Neither are the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the, of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. You know what we have to do? We have to be very careful about our desires, our appetites. Could I ask you tonight, what are the things that you desire? Oh, I really want to do that. Or, man, if I could only get this, if, if I could only find a way to do that where my spouse wouldn't find out, or as a child, if I could only get away with that and my parents not find out, and what we'll find is many times their worldly desires. In Titus chapter number 2, verse number 12, we read these words teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, those desires, those worldly passions, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You want a challenge? Let's work as parents and ask God's help as parents to teach our children to live soberly, righteously, and godly in a world that is filled with ungodliness. All around us, everywhere, bombarded with it. And it's so easy for our desires to give testimony, really, of the direction where we're headed. 
what we're, what we're interested in, what we enjoy. And oftentimes it's things of this world. I want you to see a fourth area, and that's this, attitudes. Our attitudes as Christians um, are very important. I, can I can't tell you how many times as a young person, my uh, parents would say this to me, it's not what you said that got you in trouble, it's the way that you said it. Because I had a bad attitude. And I needed an attitude adjustment. But the sad thing is, do you know how many grown adult Christians who I know that have bad attitudes? Grumbling, complaining, bickering, backbiting, and we get upset when the children do it. But I'll just say this, there is oftentimes we need a good old fashioned out to the woodshed experience from our Heavenly Father because of the very same thing, because of our attitude. Um, you say, well, what kind of attitude should I have? Just go and read Matthew chapter 5. The Beatitudes, that's what you want. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Go down that list, and those are the attitudes that we ought to be instilling in our, in our children, in our generation. And as you go through those, the, the peacemakers, and, and you read all about the, the merciful, and you go down that list, you know what you're going to find? There's not many people that are striving to please God in those ways. They're not seeking to make peace. They're, they're not seeking to live pure and meek and do right. But that is what God is, is interested in. By the way, he says in that passage, our reward is exceeding great if we do those things. So attitudes are very important. It is, it is uh, important as parents that we are very in tune with the atti our attitudes and the attitudes of our children. But I want you to go to Proverbs chapter number 7. There's another one here. In Proverbs chapter number 7, we see another area where many people go wayward. And in Proverbs chapter number 7, I think we could say in the area of attire. Uh, the, the things that we wear. Proverbs chapter 7 describes a person and they're really, they're described in many ways by actions. But if you look at verse number 10, a description is given here. And behold, there met him a woman. This was not a godly woman. As a matter of fact, it was a harlot. But she is described as one with the attire of a harlot. It was just known. You could know not even by talking to her. You could know by looking at her in her attire. And there is a lot that could be said about this subject. But I'll say this. Sadly, we're not passing on to the next generation the importance of being modest and distinct in our attire. It's not happening. And I'll tell you this. God is concerned about it. Our attire should not draw attention to ourselves and to our body. I, I love what, I don't even know who said it, but I still have written it down. Let the arrows of your clothing point to your face. Let, let people see your countenance. Do you know that as people, as a, as a, um, a dad, you teach your children, when someone's talking, you look at them in the eyes. Why? It shows you're not trying to hide anything. So you want the attention to be drawn to the face. I want them to look at that. And so uh, I'll tell my girls, I'll say, listen, if I see some guy looking at you in the wrong way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a hurting on him, okay? And yet how easy it is uh, for us to say, I don't want to fight that battle. I don't want to go there. Well, I just want to, you know, that's, that's not an area I want to fight with my young person. I'll, I'll tell you, listen, it ought to be a battle that you're willing to fight. Because what's going to happen is if you and I don't pay attention to that, as they grow up and they do what they want to do, they're going to do what pleases them. And the challenge is that we give the right opinion of Jesus Christ. Hey, that's one reason why I think it's still important in the way we come to God's house. Let's give them our best. That, that doesn't mean you have to wear a suit and tie. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying this is we ought to be willing to give our best to him. We ought to be willing to come and, and at least, uh, you know, get, hey, if you don't take a shower all week, take one Saturday night or Sunday morning, man. Just, you know, you got guys, you know, cl clean up a little bit more. Spend some time uh, because it is, it's important. And the things that we allow our children to do, in essence, we're saying that's okay. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's times where my wife, and by, by the way, very discerning, and, uh, she'll uh, have my, her, our daughters try on something, but she'll say, you're going to check with your dad. Amen. And there's times they've come down and be like, nope, we're not doing that. Mm -mm, not happening. I don't care if they think I'm a bad guy or not. It's not happening. Because uh, I want to protect that. Amen. 
And I think it's important that we do that. It's not something that is it's, it's popular to preach on, but I think God's word is very clear. It's principles. It's not, can I wear this and can I wear that? It is the principles of modesty. God wants us to be modest. God wants us to be distinct. You know why there's so much uh, confusion in our world about whether a man is a man and a woman is a woman because the, the lines have just been blurred. God says a man is a man and a woman is a woman. And they ought to act accordingly. They ought to dress accordingly. They ought to live accordingly. They ought to talk accordingly. And so attire is very important. I want you to see another one, activities. The activities that uh, we're involved in really paint pictures to our, to our children, to this generation. Things that we allow, things that we don't allow. We can use those as teaching opportunities. Maybe as a parent, you've told your children, hey, uh, we don't do that. I hope you can at times say, here's why we don't do that. Here's why we don't involve ourselves in that. There's times you may not be able to do that. You might say, well, uh, I just don't have peace about doing that right now. And I never understood that as a child until I became a parent. And as a parent, uh, we're not doing that. Why, Dad? I don't know quite now, but we're not doing that. But when you can explain to them, well, here's why we don't do that. Here's why our family has chosen not to be involved in that. Here's why others may do that, but we don't. Not that we're any better than they are. They're any better than we are. Just for us, here's a principle. Here's a standard that we have set. And here's activities that we will involve ourselves in. Here's activities where we won't involve ourselves in. And we're teaching. We're training. We want to teach them what they, they, uh, what, what they can do in following the Lord. Another one is in the area of ambitions. Ambitions, And this is one that I think we're seeing that really is not only affecting what we would think of as children, but in a way, uh, adults. It's sad to me that in a society that we live in, you go up to a grown adult and you ask them what they want to do, what they want to be, and they can't tell you. There's no ambition. No desire to work, no desire to provide, no desire to move forward. And it's just foreign to me because it was instilled in me as a young person. Hey, listen. We're going to do something with our life. And most importantly, we want you to please God with your life. And so I remember looking forward to going to Bible college. I remember looking forward to getting married. I, I remember looking forward to uh, that first ministry where we were involved in. There was ambition. I remember traveling. We we're out in the state of California. We were at a church. And I had flown out there. Candace had to stay back. Maybe because of one of the many children we were having. I don't know. But she had to stay back. And I flew out there. And I stayed with a man and his grown son. And all week, I would say to him, like, hey, what are you doing with your life? Well, I, I don't know. Are you looking for a job? No, I'm not really interested in getting a job. College? Nah, no, I kind of tried that, didn't like it. All right, what do you want to do? Well, I, I enjoy staying home and playing video games all day. And that's what he did all week long. The whole week I was there. I mean, I'm out there and I'm just like, I got to get out and do something. Like, you want to go out? You want to go out and do some running? You want to go out? We'll go, we'll, we'll go play tennis. What do you want to do? No, I'm just fine. And that's all he did all week. No ambition. As a young, as a youth pastor, I remember asking young people, I'd say, hey, listen, what do you want to do with your life? And some of them had an idea. Well, I'd like to do this or I'd be interested in this. And I'd always direct that attention. All right. Is this what you want to do or is this what God wants you to do? Is this what your parents want you to do or is this what God wants you to do? And you know, what we ought to be instilling in our children is that desire. You know what? I want you to do what God wants you to do. Oh, we can point them in a direction. I, I pray that our children, that God will use them. I'd love it if God would call someone to be pastors and missionaries. God may choose not to do that. He's got veto power, but that doesn't mean I can't point them in that direction. God may want them to be a mechanic. God may want them to do carpentry work, be a nurse or a teacher. But all I know is this. I want to point them in a direction where I want them to do something with their life. What is it that God desires for us to do all of these things that we've talked about. Activities, ambitions, attire, um, our acquaintances. You know what they are? They're what the Proverbs 20, 11 says, our doings. They are the things that we are involved in. But I want you to see an illustration in closing tonight. Numbers chapter 32. That's the principle. That's the, the nugget of, wiz, uh, of wisdom is even a child is known by his doing. So what are you known for? Are you known the way you dress? Are you known because of the friends that you have? Are you known because of the activities that you're involved in or the ambitions that you have or maybe that you don't have? What are you known for? What will you be known for? Well, we come to Proverbs, or Numbers chapter number 32 and we examine an example from God's Word. 
And I think there are many young people that become distracted. They become destroyed and devastated by uh, decisions in their life because they're really not pushed to go somewhere to please God. So Numbers chapter number 32, and uh, over the past few weeks, I think we have pointed back and made reference to this as we've even looked at the, at the book of Joshua. But notice in cha Numbers chapter number 32, we'll read a verse here in just a moment, but just to give you a little background, the Israelites had conquered the country possessed by Og, king of Bashan, and Sion, king of the Amorites. The tribes of Reuben and Gad are mentioned here. They're going to receive an inheritance. They have great quantities of cattle, which by the way, in that day, there was great wealth involved in that. There was great wealth here. And so they're looking for a land where they can settle and they can really raise cattle. It is, it's, it's one thing that they did. They did it very well. So they're looking for a nice pasture country. They're looking for something that'll sustain a large uh, amount of flocks. And uh, we, we see this story in Numbers chapter number 32. Look beginning in verse number 16. And there came near unto him and said, We will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones. But we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them unto their place and our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. Notice verse 19. For we will not inherit with them on the yonder side, Jordan, or forward, because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side, Jordan. It's interesting. These people didn't want to stay in the wilderness, but they didn't want to go in and, and fight the battle. There was battles that still had to be fought. They saw this land and they thought, hey, we'll settle here. This is a great place to raise cattle. By the way, listen, it was a great place to raise cattle, but it wasn't where God wanted them to raise their children. Same thing happened with Lot. You remember when Abraham and Lot are there discussing, hey, which direction are you going to go? Abraham being the humble man that he is. God's promised Abraham, but Abraham says to Lot, Lot, look out, and I want you to say, what direction would you like to go? If you go, if you go to the uh, right hand, I'll go to the left hand. If you go to the left hand, I'll go to the right hand. That's an interesting study of its own. What did he mean? Well, if you look at that, when they would give direction in the Middle East, they would face toward the Mediterranean Sea. It never moved, okay? So they would face that direction. So basically, Abraham says, hey, if you go to the north, I'll go to the south. If you go to the south, I'll go to the north. Right hand, left hand, left hand, right hand. And the Bible says that Lot looked to the east. So guess what? That wasn't a choice, all right? You're either north or south. Lot basically turns in the opposite direction. He looks over all the plains of Jordan, and it says this, that there was well-watered land. Why would you be interested in well-watered land? For the same reason, they wanted pasture land, because you're cow. Boy, you can increase wealth because of this. And then the Bible says these sad words, and Lot journeyed east. That's not what God wanted Lot to do. And we see the outcome, do we not? When you study the story of Lot, you know what you'll find this? Oh yes, the plains of Jordan were a great place to raise cattle, but they were not a great place to raise children. And his children ended up taking it beyond where he went. They weren't interested in the things of God. Matter of fact, very corrupt, very evil. All because of choices that they made. And um, boy, it wasn't a very wise choice. So they knew, Gad and and, uh, and Reuben knew that God's desire for them was to cross over Jordan. That's what he wanted. That's what he had promised. They knew that. They said in verse number five, Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession and bring us not over Jordan. See, they knew that was God's plan, but oh, I don't know if we want to go fight these battles. But they decided that this place, all right, it's not, it's not Canaan. But this place is good enough. This place is okay. And so they wanted to stay and go no further and fight no more batter, battles. And the sad thing is, that's where a lot of parents find themselves. We just don't want to fight the battle. So we give in. Man, I don't want my kids upset at me. I don't want them to think I'm old-fashioned. I'm not wanting to fight that battle anymore. You know what happens if you don't fight the battle? You're going to lose the battle. 
because they're going to end up doing it anyway. Hey, they may choose to do that, but it ought not be because we uh, stopped fighting. The same could be said for a church. Do you know the truth is there are churches that say, well, you know what? We know what God's word has said about living different and being distinct and all this and standing for truth. But that's not real popular right now. So we don't really want to say much about that. And what happens is you get many people who there's no commitment and there's no, content, there's no uh, ambition to go farther. They're content right where they're at. And there's a lot of parents that are there. They're good enough to stay right where they're at and go no far, further, fearing they may be classified a fanatic. But what they end up is they find children who eventually flounder, they fail. And so the task set before us is not an easy one. It, it will not be done by those who say, you know, we'll just do this half-heartedly. We'll just kind of invest partially in the lives of the next generation. No, the truth is that it's going to take a lot of investment. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of, of uh, prayer. And so notice just a few things with me and we'll be done. God's design, as you read Numbers chapter 32, was for them to cross Jordan and to claim the land. That was God's design. And as a matter of fact, as you, as you read the story, uh, beginning there in verse number 20, And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he had driven out his enemies before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return." And be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And be sure your sin will find you out. You ever use that verse with your kids? Look at the scenario. What he's saying here. Hey, you can't just stay here and not fight the battle. You can't just not keep uh, uh, pressing on. You can't be content where you're at. God had planned on them crossing the Jordan River. That, remember the picture? We've looked at it. That's the picture of a surrendered life to Christ. It's dying to self and living for Christ. It's not the picture of going into heaven where there are no more battles that's why Paul said this in Romans 12, verses 1, I beseech you, I beg you, I beg you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, if they would have understood that. Listen, it's okay to be different. It's okay to uh, keep pressing forward. It's okay to fight the battle. It's okay to lose the battle and then to get back up and keep fighting. But don't be content where you are. God's design was for them to keep pressing forward. And the sad thing is, we often, in the same way, we do things and say things that we're not willing to do. D.L. Moody said this, We Christians, we, just, we, we may not tell a lot of lies, we just sing them in our hymns. We sing, I surrender all. Or maybe we, we uh, desire, oh yes, it's important. We teach our children it's important to be surrendered in life. And then they come one day and say, well, you know, mom and dad, I think God's called me to be a missionary. Oh, I don't know about that. You might have to go away from us. And we may not see you very often. Do you know how many times I've heard that as a youth pastor? Or, you know, uh, I know it's important for, for them to get a, a good education, but just so they have something to fall back on, you know, God doesn't need a fall back on plan. What he equips them and enables them to do, he's going to provide for them all along the way. And so we may sing all to Jesus, I surrender all to him, I freely give, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Do we exemplify that? Do I exemplify that? God's design. But as you study the story, their desire was to stay right where they are. All they could see was the supply of what they had, the pasture land. They could not see all that God would have for them. They could see right there and they were content with that. So they tried to make it sound spiritual. If you look at verse 19, the verse we read, For we will not inherit with them on yonder side, Jordan, or forward, because our inheritance is fallen to us on this side, Jordan. They, make, they made it sound like this was the will of God. Hey, this is good here, so we believe this is what God want, uh, wants. What did God say? I want you to cross Jordan, and I want you to conquer the land, and I want you to possess it. But they were content. Someone once said this, selfishness is never worse than when it puts on the garb of religion. 
We sometimes desire what we want. And so because of that, God's design was for them to go. They desired to stay. In essence, they became deficient. They exposed themselves unnecessarily to their enemy. They missed, if you, if you look, they missed many blessings. They excluded their families from seeing victory at Jericho. And their faith was not enabled to increase. They really didn't believe, they didn't get to see the great things that others did. And sad to say that we have seen a generation of young people who've grown up in church that really haven't seen God do a great work. It's kind of been mediocre. It's kind of been we're just going to survive and we're just going to maintain. And uh, we may talk about revival, but yeah, that was a long time ago. And so they begin to wonder, oh yeah, we, they, our, we, our church still has prayer meeting, but I don't really know if God's really doing anything or not. And their faith doesn't increase. You know how exciting it is when your children see answers to prayer? It's encouraging. It's encouraging to, to see that. It's encouraging to see not only parents who come to church, but see young people as they grow and they make decisions on their own, then they're like, hey, now we want to be in church. We want to come and be faithful. Not just because mom and dad made us come, but we want to come. And um, it, it, it's exciting to see that. That's why I think it's important in the day we live in to not only tell our children that church is important, show them church is important. Not only tell them that prayer works, show them that prayer works. And over and over again, we can, we can see that through God's Word. The, uh, the uh, interesting thing about these two in Colorado, they are ones who, as seniors, they go in, they murder their fellow classmates, teacher, and um, if you look at their lives, you'll see they were allowed to spend countless hours in front of a computer screen, they played violent video games. Records show they searched wicked sites on the internet, watched vicious movies, and they conjured up details of a horrendous massacre. They came up with this. And many parents, we wonder and we worry, well, you know what, if I don't allow my kids to be involved in some of those things, they're going to rebel. No, listen, if you don't teach them and train them to love God with all their heart, soul, their mind, and their strength, they're already headed that direction. That's the direction they're going. And so our desire ought to be as a church and as parents really to, to look. Are there any warning signs? Are there things that they're talking about? Are there things that they're involved in? Like I mentioned, uh, the, the warning lights on our, on our automobiles. We don't ignore those problems, and yet we might see warning lights or something may come. What's going to happen? What are we going to do? And... Um, I've been excited to see some of the young people here at the church that have come to know Christ. We pray about that. I hope as a parent you, you pray about that. But we want to see these young people come to know Christ, but not just to, to come to know Him in salvation. That's a wonderful thing. I want them to experience the life, the abundant life of Jesus Christ. That life that is like, you know what, there is great rewards in serving God. I don't want my children to grow up and serve God because dad did. Or to go to church or be faithful to church because dad was. I want them to desire to do that because that's a decision that they've made. And so I believe God, his design is that we, we face those battles. We fight those battles. We stand for truth. We don't compromise. We can do that lovingly. We can train up a child, our children, and we can be great examples to them. I appreciate as a pastor the, the support as a parent that I've gotten here at Faith Baptist Church from those of you that have been in the journey a lot longer than I have. Some of you raised boys, and I've gotten great knowledge from you. Some of you have raised girls, and I've needed all the help I can get. You know, it's... <laughs> But isn't that a blessing that you can go to others and you can maybe learn from mistakes that they made? Nah, don't try this. Or, you know what, here's something that we did. What a blessing that is. We can pray for our children. We can uh, really ask God's mercy on this next generation. But wouldn't it be wonderful if Faith Baptist Church, through Faith Baptist Church and the parents 
and the grandparents and others involved in the lives, Sunday school teachers, youth workers. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see a generation of young people that move out from this place or maybe stay right here but just continue on with what they've been taught and trained all around the world? And uh, I think that's something we ought to pray about. That's all, that we ought, to, we ought to really encourage our children and young people towards, but how can we do that if we're not willing to do it? Maybe, maybe God's called you to do something and you haven't been willing to say yes. And maybe your children need to see you say, oh yeah, we'll do that. We'll obey in that area. We'll follow the Lord in that step of obedience. And then that encourages them that they can take their step of obedience. Even a child is known by his doings. Adults are well. What are you known for? Are you known as someone, child or an adult, someone who loves God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength? It's not just words that you say, but your action and your life backs that up. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a people that are exhibiting signs that we have been born again. We're not content where we are. We don't place emphasis on an empty profession of faith, but we truly have come to the place where you have changed our lives. It's evident. I'm excited about these that in just a couple weeks are going to follow you in believer's baptism and just identify with you. What a, what a great testimony that we can come alongside and encourage them in this decision. As parents and as a pastor, I'm encouraged to see parents who are faithful to bring their children to themselves be here faithfully on a Sunday night, even on a Wednesday night, and uh, just encourage them in that way. But I pray that we'd consider even steps of obedience. Maybe there is some areas of worldliness. Maybe there is some appetites that are being fed that don't need to be fed. Mary, may, maybe there's some uh, acquaintances that, that need to be encouraged and maybe some that need to be discouraged. I pray that we'd examine those friendships in our own lives and we'd really desire to, to, number one, have a close relationship with you, but secondly, that we would seek to have godly influences in our lives. And I believe the church plays an important role in that. Help us to be the church that you desire that we be in this area. With heads bowed, eyes closed, we don't always give an invitation on a Sunday night, but I think it's important. It's sad to see where we are in our country and we bemoan that fact. But here's the question. You may not be able to do something with someone else.